Welcome everybody to another episode of the Montana Business Vlog. I'm Joel Silverman here today with me. I've got Clint Lohman. Uh, you know, I'm just excited for this one. You can tell because I've already screwed up my intro. It's This is not the norm. You, you're going to be so impressed with this one. I'm putting a lot of heat on Clint right now to meet the next level. Uh, you, you can tell he's already got cotton mouth here. He's got to take a little sip of the yep. water there. But... Uh, this is a rare opportunity to get to sit down with somebody who's in the venture capital world. Uh, for all you business owners out there, small business people, this guy has so much knowledge to give about how to get a business started, about starting up big businesses, small businesses. Clint has helped people around the state of Montana get businesses going of all sorts. He's very active in the gaming industry, in the restaurant, the hospitality industry. I mean, he's across so many boards of businesses that it, it's unbelievable. So, uh, you know, Clint, I, I got to thank you first and foremost for, for coming in with us, buddy. Thank you for having me. It's a nice little interview here with Brad. <laughs> and, and yeah, Brad Oldhouse behind the camera from Social Flicks. He, I thank heavens this thing is on a tripod because otherwise the camera would be shaking already. Brad's laughing in the background. We've been having just a riot talking about things like Jim Kramer, uh, various people that, that Clint has gotten to know and, and really to me, just to start this out, proximity. You and I, before Brad even showed up, we were talking about proximity and about leveraging people but you had something that was really neat, Clint, that you were talking about, which was you weren't asking anybody for anything. You were there giving, right? right yep. and, and that's what draws people to you, people like a Jim Cramer or people in, in, in high level businesses that are trying to get with you on projects. It's not because you're trying to sell them, you're trying to give back to them. Right, I try to give my knowledge and my expertise to them and not not really be looking for anything from them. And uh, that's how I've gotten a pretty big Rolodex because of that. And I've, I'm across a lot of different varieties of businesses from oil to software to gaming to hospitality, bar, restaurant. Uh, I'm building software here at my office. Uh, I'm in a digital outdoor business and back east. And uh, I'm actually in a private equity with some folks back in New York. So I got a pretty wide variety of stuff. So I. Having that uh, big Rolodex is kind of fun, and, and I've enjoyed meeting, and I probably have about 5,000 people on my phone that I can pull up and talk to at any time, so it's pretty interesting. So let's say I'm a small business person in yep. Montana, and I see someone like Clint Lohman who's doing this. How would I, because I believe in emulating people, I believe why go create a new road when somebody's already done that? How can I say, geez, well, that, that's never open to someone like me. How could I start opening doors like that? You gotta be super flexible. You have to be super persistent. You have to plan. You have to be super positive. All the P's, you know, and have, <laughs> you have to learn how to uh, create and learn how to pick partners. Uh, those are the kind of things that I start looking at. You have to have a passion for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So all those P's, the way I look at it, is what kind of brings all that together. Uh, and some people just won't do the P's. I mean, a lot of people, I, I, when I first started doing this, I thought, God, everybody's just like me. But the more I looked at it, 95% uh, of the people aren't like me. They don't want to do all this stuff. And when you have all the P's, the biggest thing you have to put together is you have to have hard work to pass everybody up and actually get, a, get somewhere that 95% of the people aren't doing. So I think that's the biggest thing that most people aren't willing to sacrifice all those P's and work super hard to get where they're going. That's where they stop. Mm -hmm. That's why most people don't do it. Yeah. Because it's harder than it looks. Yeah. And I try to make it look super easy. That's not necessarily very advantageous for people that try to do it. Because I'm very positive about doing it and passionate about it. So it looks easy, but it's not that easy for other people to do what I'm doing. How so? What do you mean by that? Just, just visualize the first 20 years I work, you know, 16, 18 hour days, and I just never let up, you know, just really striving hard to make everything successful. Small businesses are hard to be successful. Montana's a small state, a lot, not a lot of people, so you, you can't, uh, you only have X number of customers, if the way I looked at it in Montana, you don't want to burn any customers, irritate customers, 
you want to always be look never cut the bridge behind you no matter what, who it is or why it is because you may have to go back over that bridge eventually and, and usually you will in a state like Montana pretty small so cutting back to the new business owner or yep. somebody who's trying to elevate their game you talk about the peas you talk about the hard work how would somebody go get proximity to someone who's above them in the business world to go learn from them? Boy, I did that through just not being afraid to walk up to somebody, talk to them, ask questions, get to know people, uh, go to events. I met, you know, on a cruise ship, you know, 15 years ago, I met a, a billionaire out of California. We're super good friends. He's led me down a lot of good paths. He has a lot of the same concepts that I do. Mm -hmm. He works super hard. He probably works harder than I do. He's made all of his money from zero on up. Nothing was given to him. He made it all on himself. And so I watched what he did. He We talked quite a bit about ideas and I just met him by just, because I saw him two days to row on a phone and I asked if I could borrow his phone. I didn't have a phone on a cruise ship. So <laughs> he had a sat phone and I said, hey, got any way I can borrow that, you know? Mm -hmm. So then we got to talking. And so that's and that's kind of how I get to know people just through I'm not afraid to approach people I mean everybody's the same yeah I mean really we're all just people bad. yeah so you just approach people you talk to them you you're, you're not asked for anything you just want their advice or experience mm -hmm. whatever you may go down the path I just recently met you know Philip Bush uh, probably about a year ago here and hit it off he really enjoyed talking to me I enjoyed talking to him uh, we've become friends. We're going to go meet together, try to do some be business ventures together. I'm not really asking anything from him. I'm going to share my experience. He's going to share his. He only mm -hmm. knows the beer business. I know a lot of other things. He wants to diversify into real estate, into oil, mm -hmm. some other things. So we're going to sit down and have a good conversation. He doesn't have a really good relationship with his father. They can sit down and talk business. He said he, he's getting a fight. So yeah. that's, that's how I got into Philip. Yeah just at the cannery downtown, having a beverage after golf, through some friends of mine. That's it. So now, I don't know if you can pick this up on the camera, but Clint recently split his lip, yep. and it's a hell of a good story. So, oh, yeah. so why don't you tell us that? I was, I was over in uh, eastern Montana by Wolf Point by the reservation, and my friend owns a ranch over there, and we decided to go uh, coyote hunting on snowmobiles, and I had one in the sights, and uh, Right when I was getting up close to it, I hit a big snow drift and I went over the hood of the snowmobile, caught my lip and I got my eye a little bit on the steering wheel on the way over, so I'm just recovering. I got a big gash on my leg where I, I think I caught the rail on the side of the snowmobile on the way over, or the handlebars, I'm not sure which. I didn't get the coyote got away, but it was a sure was a fun day. <laughs> so I'm a little beat up yet. So that tells you a little bit about Clint. He, he's- I'm adventurous. He, yeah, you get after it. Now. Before even Brad showed up, there was something interesting we were talking about that I, I you, you've got this dichotomy in you, this this double-edged sword here, where you say, I, I grew up with the mentality that I couldn't have things laid out because that wouldn't allow me to be as flexible as I needed to be, but then you pulled out a list of 17 things you had to get done today. That's just so I can sleep at night. <laughs> Every night I go and update my list from the day before. Ah. So before I go to bed, I sit down, I update my list. So I know I reprioritize it, add stuff to it, take stuff away so I don't forget to do something the next day. That's kind of my organization. Other than that, I'm very flexible. Uh, if something comes up, I may fly to Kalispell today to go do something if something were to come up, or I might drive to Billings, and, and none of it's on my list for today. Mm -hmm. So I have to be super flexible. When I first started in business, I told myself if I have to move to Billings, Denver, whatever it takes to make this work, I, I got to be able to do it. So I've been super flexible. Instead of moving, I, I got into plane business because I thought I'm gonna learn how to fly. It's a lot easier than moving. Mm -hmm. So that's in 80, 1985, I got my pilot's license. I've been flying for 30 years. And it gets you out of the region easier when you can just jump in your plane and fly to Billings, jump in your plane and fly to Denver, do meetings. And that, that really helps with building uh, a bunch of uh, people and businesses knowledge. I mean, I went to so many meetings with people all over the country, just being flexible. So what do you fly? Well, I got five airplanes because I was in the flying business of Sunbird Aviation, so I still have a King Air Citation, a Mooney, and two twin Cessna 340s. What so, do you, which one do you prefer to fly? I like the Mooney, actually, because it's 10, 
10 gallons of an hour. You can fly 200 miles on 10 gallons. That's really reasonably priced. Yeah. And it's easy to fly, but it doesn't have all the capability for de-ice and you know bad weather stuff. So when you do that, I, you know, the King Air Super, you can load it down. Uh, the jet, obviously, you can fly across the country wherever. I'm flying to Fargo tomorrow to do a bunch of meetings with some entrepreneurs in Fargo. So taking the King Air tomorrow because I uh, we were flying into uh, Denver area and dropping off my friends from a Vegas run and we caught a big gust of wind. We went over in a, in, I call it in the rhubarb, a little off the side of the runway, hit a light. So my plane's getting fixed from the light hitting the underneath of the wing. So yeah. getting that repaired. So we had a little bit of a rhubarb run. It wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> Just went off the runway, no big deal. I yeah, clipped the light, five lights. I had to go to the county and buy them new lights. You're the county owned the airport, so I yeah. had to talk to the county commissioners and buy them five new lights. <laughs> my, my bad. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, you definitely stay flexible when something like that can happen and it doesn't really bother you. <laughs> no, I let out a little bell or I yelled at the pilots, but I when I seen what was going on, but they recovered pretty well. And, and my pilot is Troy Downing, the guy that's uh, starting of Yahoo. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. No. Uh, Troy is my pilot for the jet. He yeah. flies that uh, MiG fighter jet around Bozeman. Okay. He's my, I, he flies me around where I want to go. And he's very flexible too. Mm -hmm. He's an entrepreneur and flexible. So I've enjoyed being around him. Nice. So, Let's go from that. Let's get back on to the proximity. Uh, you end up with a friend. You're going to the Eagles game this last year. I see that you post this on Instagram, this picture with somebody who is I'm a huge fan of, and I'm looking at this going, what the F, Clint? Yeah, like, how do, how you, do you do this? First of all, I didn't know I was going to go to Philly that day. Last minute, I decided to go because I really want to see this... Uh, Aero aggregate kiln. I can't picture the kiln in my mind. <clears throat> so I jump on a plane, I go over there, we're talking, we have no idea there's even a Philly game that night. And we're sitting there around the table talking and they go, what are you gonna do tonight? And we go, well, yeah, we don't have anything. And the guy goes, well, God, I have tickets for the game. You wanna come? And I said, sure. And the other guy goes, nah, let's just go to the hotel. I said, I'm going to the game. And I had no point, and still didn't know I was going to a box seat. I just wanted to go to the game, get out, check out the stadium. I never been to Philly. I was excited about looking around, checking the area out. He wasn't flexible, go to bed, get up, you know. And I said, you're going to miss out on the game. So anyway, he came with, we went to it, found out later we were actually going to go to a booth, a uh, box seat with Jim Kramer. And uh, Tom was the friend from the aero aggregate business and and met uh, Booyah there and had a good time. <laughs> Eagles won and we had a pretty good little party and got to know him pretty well. and. Tried to invite him out to Montana, and I think he's going to be coming here in the next probably year. Within a year, he'll be out. He said he wants to do a deal with the Yellowstone Club. So, Jim, if you happen or somebody on your team happens to see this, which I doubt it, but Booyaski Daddy, get out here, Yellowstone Mountain Club. We want to see you here doing a show. That would be phenomenal. And go Phillies. Yes, fly Eagles, fly baby. Even though I'm a Niners fan, which we're not looking so pretty again, but. Hopefully, we got, yeah, we got to stay positive. But So part of what I take away from that story, Clint, is A, staying flexible, B, don't be afraid to just jump on something, yeah. to go experience, because you never know where it's going to take you. And one thing I do, too, is I, I have tons of opportunity to come along, and I don't ever not check anything out. I check all the opportunity out. That's why I hired Rusty in my office. He's basically... Mm -hmm take a first look at him because I was getting too many deals a day you know I get a mm -hmm. deal a day and before long you can't do what you're normally doing so I actually hired Rusty to check through my deal a days and see which ones were worth taking a better look at so that's kind of where we uh, that's how I kind of sort through my deals and I know you're a big believer in doing business with the people you can trust you believe in their personality how do you find someone like rusty that you you are going to believe in and trust because you've got to have a lot of faith in him right right and how i met rusty was really strange he's a from a private equity uh he worked in toronto for 10 years mergers and acquisition billion dollar deals for transamerica 
I was in the boiling I was in the boiling river first time I'd ever been there over by Gardner mm -hmm. sitting there and of course Beth my wife she likes to talk to everybody more than I do so she starts visiting with these two yuppies I call them they're tree huggers and uh, <laughs> they have hats on and they're goofy you know scraggly looking hairs in their eyes and Beth's talking to them finally I come over and they go yeah you got to meet Trish and Rusty they're thinking about moving to Bozeman I go really what's he do he goes well he's in private equity I go well, there's not a lot of private equity in Bozeman yeah and I said, but he said, oh, but his wife is going to come to Bozeman and teach presidents of college how to be presidents of colleges. That's her job. Wow. So she, they were offering her big, you know, big pay to come to Bozeman and set up a program here. And she, they couldn't pass the opportunity. They love the outdoors. I didn't hear for Rusty for a while. He saw me on, in, or not on Instagram, but uh, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, let's get together. I got together with him kind of did a little interview. I wasn't really hiring, but I, I knew I needed somebody. And we went skiing, sat around, talked all night one night and said, hey, why don't you come to work for a couple of years and see how it works? You know, I just wanted to do like a two year commitment because mm -hmm. I didn't know how I, well I would like somebody doing that. So it's worked out well and he's really helped. And he brings more of a <clears throat> corporate structure mm -hmm. to my, I'm kind of a, uh, more of a small business kind of an operator. He's more of a kind of the bigger up, kind of a higher view type person and he's a lot more about numbers than I am. I'm more about gut feel, he's more about numbers. So it's a pretty good combination of uh, power. <clears throat> so I like that because too many times in business, I watch business owners who want to hire someone just like them. Instead of hiring someone or getting somebody on their team who fills in the areas that they're not strong at. He contradicts a lot of my decisions. He'll say, are you sure? You know, he'll actually come from the contrary inside and say, whoa, this isn't the way I look at it. And then I have to explain myself, oh, that makes sense. You know, kind of my gut feeling, put it into it, my numbers into it. Mm -hmm. Like he'll, he'll love, he loves spreadsheets. Uh, he fills out everything on a spreadsheet. I can get to the answer before he even gets the spreadsheet started. Could I just do it differently? Mm -hmm. And so he comes to a number, I come to a number, and they're the same number, but I just do mine differently. I do the quick math in the head, he does the paper or on the computer, mm -hmm. and we just had a lot of those kind of decisions and, and looking looking at the stuff, businesses, and it's been pretty fun seeing it from another angle. Nice. I never had anybody like that in my life before. It came from corporate, and he's uh, super educated. I've got two years of college is all. Mm -hmm. He's got an MBA, he's got all this, you know, he's been doing a lot of study, and knows a lot about business stuff that I just kind of brush over. Some of the fine details of business, I just go over the top of because I don't want to learn all that stuff. It's all basically book smart. And I, mm -hmm. I want to be street smart, I guess, is kind of how I look at it. Well, clearly it's worked for you. It worked for what I'm doing. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a different approach than some people. A lot of people do the book smart stuff, and it works too, mm -hmm. just in a different angle. Some people get... <clears throat> so tied up in book smart they can't make decisions that's what i see i got mm -hmm. i got one friend that's a he owns a glass business in town he never could really get it going because he was too worried about what the book say you're supposed to do he could never get a gut feel to, to expand to do the right things he could never make decisions so he just kind of floundered around eventually just gave it up because he couldn't do it and he was super smart had all the credentials business school graduate you know and all this mm -hmm. but just couldn't pull the couldn't get the thing off the ground and it, there was plenty of business to be had. So <clears throat> what is it that allows you to make that decision? What's your process, you know, uh, do you, if you have one? I kind of do. When I started out, I didn't have a process. When I was 21, I started thinking, how am I going to make the right decisions? And I, it took me about four or five years of making lots of decisions before I started believing in myself, saying, hey, I'm more right than most people. I, you know, I just all of a sudden one day I thought, God, I think I'm better than the accountant, better than the lawyer. I'm getting advice from them and they're wrong. And I can see it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I guess that's when I kind of turned the corner and say, you know, my gut is right. Even these professionals tell me it's not. I actually listen to them, but sometimes I don't mm -hmm. agree with them. I do something totally opposite. Yeah. I mean, Mike Garrity, I mean, he doesn't know how many times he said, don't do this. And I do it anyway, mm -hmm. you know, because I know it's the right thing. Yeah. But he's professionally saying it's wrong, but I'm gut feeling and street smart saying it is right so yeah. that's i make a lot of decisions just on my own beliefs and it's, it's worked pretty well yeah i mean i've had some failures no doubt because you can't win on everything yeah and absolutely. you got it and you win you actually learn more from losing than you do winning mm -hmm. i mean and that's for, for sure because you never want to do that stuff again so 
Let's follow that a little bit because what I love is the psychology of business. That is such a huge part for me and, and that's why we're doing this, right? Why okay. we're doing these interviews. You say you you learn more from your your failures or your losing than you do from your winning. Why is that? I think when you're competitive, like I am, I was in sports and very competitive. I don't like losing and when I do lose, it's like, wow, I don't ever want to do that again. I picked a couple bad partners once and I really struggled getting out of those arrangements and lawsuits and I just, I did negative energy and I just, just turned me off. And it just, mm -hmm. it sticks in your brain more than winners. It just does. I don't mm -hmm. know why it does. It's just more difficult to deal with, I think, than winners. Winners are easy and everybody's happy and on the other side, flip side, when you lose money or you get bad partners, that just sticks with you. You don't ever want to go down that process, so you steer away from that. You do the agility thinking where over here, make a mistake, turn back, and kind of get to the straighter line as you go forward. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of try to think is go keep making decisions because if you make no decision, you go straight sideways. Mm -hmm. You got to make decisions or you never get to the top of the, you never get to where you're going. A absolutely. I think a lot of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you were asking earlier what people, why people don't do that or aren't able to get into business because they, they don't want to take that process and do it. Well, is it. Don't you think that it's people are more fearful of the loss than they're hopeful of the gain? Yep. And they're afraid to make a decision because they're not sure which one's right and so yeah. they make no decision. No decision is worse than a halfway good decision. And you will you adjust. Mind. You will adjust if you stay on it. If yeah. you give up, you won't, but you will adjust. Yes. And people don't believe in adjusting because they're not flexible again. Most people aren't flexible. They're really structured thinking and I think that's where they fail. If you gotta be super flexible when you're making these decisions and you gotta stay on them and you gotta stay organized and you gotta make sure you don't let stuff fall through the cracks. You gotta be detailed but not stumbling on detail. And it's, it's, it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. And it's highly competitive now. You got all this technology and Way, yeah. way more than it used to be, about 10 times. You know, with phones and iPads and computers everywhere. Well, the, the ability to get a business up and running is easier than we've ever seen it in history, yep. right? right. And, and ideas are happening and being implemented so fast that what I tend to see is the people you're talking about that get stuck in that sideways, can't make a decision, yep. they're the ones who never even get it off the ground. Right. What allows you, or what allowed you when you were, if you think back to when you were in your early yep. 20s, what allowed you to get over that? Basically, I, my parents didn't have a lot of money. I didn't want to have my kids raised in that same environment. I think that was the driving factor. I thought if I work harder and faster than everybody else and make decisions and be positive, I can do whatever I want to do. And I just kept telling myself that over and over, 21, 22, 23, 24 years old. And then all of a sudden I started seeing progress. And then I started really believing in myself. And then I started talking to different accounting people. I was trying to get as much information, because I didn't even know how to read a financial. You know, I, did, I had no background in business. I was an electronic technician by trade. I went to a two-year trade school, so I had none of the knowledge. So I had to learn it all as I was going. And that's, that's a whole other deal too, to, to learn how to read financials and do banking and start businesses and learn all that as you're going. But I was able to do that. I think I multitask very well also. That's a, a benefit that I have built into my system. I think it's just something I have a pretty good memory of. You know, back in the day before phones, I could remember three or 400 phone numbers just off the top of my head. You know, just really good memory. And, and I think that helps in all this process. You, you touched on something that I don't hear very often which is, and I, I want to make sure our viewers really pick up on this, Okay. which is you educated yourself. You went out after your own education to learn financials, to stretch your memory, to push yourself. That's to me probably the single greatest differentiator between success and what I would call failure, which to me, failure isn't not getting your end result. Right. Failure is not learning from why you didn't get it. Right. I think it is a big differentiator. Different, what is it? <laughs> Sorry. Differentiator. Differentiator <laughs> is what you're talking about. Cause yeah. I just don't think through a lot of, I think that comes natural, but it really mm -hmm. doesn't come natural. To me, it comes really natural. 
maybe it's because I've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of people have struggled with. What I do, they, I make it look super easy because mm -hmm. I just do it naturally, and I, I make tons of five thousand decisions a day. I make so many more decisions than the average person. I think the more you practice something, the better you get at it. Well, doesn't that go? I mean, that that goes right to Nike's slogan: "Just do it." Yeah. Right? Is you've got to always stretch yourself. Right. And and that's one thing I've always been amazed watching you in business is you're always evolving. And it drives my wife nuts. Beth doesn't like me. She wants to me to quit evolving, but I just can't help myself. Yeah. I'm trying to do it in more smart ways so I don't risk as much. I try to mm -hmm. risk other people's money instead of mine now. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about ever trying to rebuild everything. I don't want to go back through the whole rebuilding of 30 years, but I, I want to keep being innovative and I want to keep stretching my mind and I want to teach young kids. I want to help my son. I want to help everybody. That's, I go to the college and put on my little entrepreneur thing every quarter, and, and kids just keep calling me and they love it. And mm -hmm. So I like to give back a little bit of my knowledge because I never had anybody to lean on. My, my dad didn't really have any business experience. He was a teacher, uh, book smart stuff, and I just I, I needed a way to get into my street street thinking. You You hit two more unbelievable points here. I want to make sure we get both of these. The first one, risking other people's money. Expand on that for us, if you would. Okay, I kind of hit a spot in my career where I hired Rusty and I started uh, taking some money off the table. I sold about eight or nine businesses, got money in my account, and I started thinking, I have knowledge to make money. Why don't I take other people's money and put it to work? Because other people don't seem to have the same knowledge or the same context that I do to make money. So I, I went and about that time the Bakken was firing up. So I thought I'm going to try to come up with a project over there, raise the money, me put in zero, and use everybody else's money, pay cash, I don't want any debt in the Bakken because if that doesn't work I want to be able to walk away and sorry we lost your money and be done. Mm -hmm. So we went over there and I started two uh, uh, sewer lagoons and a big RV park by Fairview and one by Watford City. And they had no uh, very little regulations. I got in really early. I raised three million dollars of people's money, just basically people that I knew in business around Montana. Most of them were Montana folks, and I they all put in fifty, hundred grand, and we raised three million dollars. Went out there, and I built the park. I built the sewer lagoons. Why we were finishing everything up, somebody came along and said we have to own this, and basically we sold it twenty minutes, twenty months after we started it. We sold it for around $9 million, gave everybody triple their money, everybody's happy. We have a party down at 14 North, hugging and kissing, and, <laughs> and that was my first experience of taking other people's money, and I kept a small piece of equity for, for doing the deal. Yeah. And so that's how I learned that's how it works. Mm -hmm. I just set it up myself. I didn't go ask anybody. I just came up with the idea I thought was fair. I actually overgave. I didn't take enough equity for what I did. Mm -hmm. Most people would have taken more. I didn't know how to do it. I wanted to learn. I learned, and so that's that's how I got into doing that. And then I've done a few other projects similar to that, and uh, and now I'm in kind of do on the investment committee for a private equity, and I'm part owner of that. So I'm seeing all their deals come through, and trying to decide which ones are good deals, and helping them raise some money and making money off other people's money. Basically, mm -hmm. same kind of concept, a little bit different angle. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a, a great story. So let's let's shift to the second part, which is giving back. Okay. Because what you started down the road of talking about uh, the university and presenting every quarter there, I've seen you at several different projects, fundraisers around town. Uh, I'm a big believer in giving back. That's what really started this project and, and getting folks like you to come on camera to share their business knowledge. What is it that drives you to give back? What What is it that gives you so much joy? Because there really is in your face, when, when I see you at these events, you have, I feel like, as much passion for giving back as you do in making deals happen. I do. One fear of mine is giving back too soon. I've seen other people do this. I saw a guy give the museum, the Rockies, a bunch of money and had to retract that. I never want to get into that situation with the economy. I'm still not debt free because mm -hmm. I haven't given up on some of the projects that I started five, seven years ago. They're all just come to fruition, so I haven't really started giving a lot. I've been trying to give more of myself than actual money. 
I will be able to give some money eventually, but I don't want to get, everybody keeps saying, you got to donate to this, you got to donate. I do donate, but I do it on a small scale because mm -hmm. I'm part of North Dakota science where I went to college. I'm part of the Glendive. I'm part of MSU. I'm part of the hospital. I'm in you know, a lot of different people have fundraisers and I do donate money to them, but it hasn't been any size of I like Special Olympics. I haven't given any money there. I, I have them in the back of my mind. But I, I want to make sure I don't get over my skis too quick mm -hmm. and start giving money away before I'm debt free. And, I, and Beth kind of bothers, bugs me about that. Let's give some money. And I said, well, let's get debt free first mm -hmm. and let me get rid of some of my big projects that I've been on for a long time and, and kind of get in a better financial position. I'm probably in, fine, in great financial position, but in my mind, I never want to go back and try to redo it all. I don't know if I have enough time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's so that's a fear of mine, and it's a, it holds me back. But it helps me make better decisions. And I'm I'm just being I'm more conservative. As you get older, you got to be more conservative. You have more to lose than you did when you have no money. You have no money, you have nothing to lose. So you go for it. Yeah. So tell us more about this quarterly project with MSU. Basically, I got invited to the professional. They call it professional coaching for entrepreneurs on their junior year. And they invited me in to come and just speak with the entrepreneurs and give my experience and my any kind of intuition I can give them to help them better their thought process of moving into either corporate world or into entrepreneurship. And you sit down with uh, 12 uh, students, three different rooms, and you rotate rooms with other guys that are like myself that go around and talk to these kids. And when I get done, they all want my email, my phone number, I share it with them. I still have kids from four or five years ago that I'm dealing with on a monthly, quarterly basis. They have ideas, a guy invented a new way to lay concrete. I helped him get all the forms, the plastic forms out of Spokane, a friend of mine owns. So I mean, I've done some people with some of these kids and I got another a guy that's graduating this year that's really been really wanting to get over here and get in the mix of this and understand coding. So I'm gonna invite him over here once he gets through with his school. Mm -hmm. Let him kind of li learn from my guys that are working here, and just so I don't mind helping people you know, build their dream. And it's just it's fun to see, and they get excited. I get excited about it, and, and before long, we're passionate, and we're you know. Well, that that to me is more valuable than any dollars that can be given. Right. Right. The uh, the so many times I see people stop because they. They don't believe that they have value to give outside of their money. money right. And to me, we sell ourselves short when we do that. That's what I'm trying to do, not the money. Just because I want to make sure, I'm not, I'm not hoarding the money, I just want to make sure I have enough to get to the end. And yeah. I want to help my kids get started in business. They're just young, they're only 25, 30, they're just learning too. I don't want to be giving all the money away and then wishing I would have something to share with them. Sure. I don't want to but, give them anything either because I want them to work and learn what working is all about before you know I help mm -hmm. them get. So they're on their own. They're doing their own things. You know, they're they're not just necessarily following what I'm doing. They're all out cutting their own path right now. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's nice to see. I built them very independent. I want them to be independent people, and they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like they're not doing what I'm doing. So. So did your kids grow up in the businesses at all? They grew up around them. Yeah. yeah. They worked in them some, but they just didn't want to do what I was doing. I think they saw me working too much, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing gone quite a bit. I, I never missed basketball games. I never missed any of the kids' events, but I was gone a lot. And I'd get up at four in the morning and take off, five in the morning, come back. And I'd try not to miss them when mm -hmm. they got off of school and try to keep the balance of family and entrepreneurship together too. So. That's really interesting because as a driven person, right, you've got all this energy, all this focus, you were able to find that balance to, to be able to still spend time with your kids. I had that in the back of my mind the whole time. I can't sacrifice the family and kids for business. It's not worth it. It's, it's really good to make money and be successful, but it's still you got to have the family because that's what basically the whole thing is. And if you forget about that, you're kind of... Uh, not doing yourself justice or the family. So I tried never to miss anything. You know, I'd just stretch in and I'd stop. And I mean, perfect example, I'm going to Butte for a basketball game for my daughter in high school. I have to go to Teasers to unjam a machine on the way. And I have to bring my youngest son with me because Beth is busy getting her hair done or whatever. Yeah. So she picks me and Bridger up at Teasers on the way to Butte <laughs> for the basketball game because I'm repairing a machine. <laughs> 
that's like squeezing in work everywhere you go. Yeah. It's basically what I do. I squeeze work in 24 seven. Yeah. And it's kind of a bad thing, but a good thing. It's it made me successful. I squeeze it in 24 seven. You bet. And I just, it's easy for me to squeeze in. Like when I built this uh, software, I am the call center still. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't get many calls. I don't want to pay somebody to be a call center for one or two calls a month. So I'm the call center. Yeah. So when somebody has a problem with, I built the software, I know how I have, I've designed and built it all. So I might as well be the call center. So people go <laughs> like, why are you doing that? It's like, well, I have all the knowledge and it's two phone calls a month. Yeah. And I'd have to pay somebody 50 grand to do that. I just pick the 50 grand myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so this, I have a little idiosyncrasies like that uh -huh. where, that may be negative, but I, that's how I do things. I'm yeah. very operational. That's mm -hmm. how I made the money off of operations. Yeah. But I'm not afraid to think bigger picture either. Mm -hmm. But it's just, that's how I know to make money is work hard and do the right things over long periods of time. Yeah. Well, for, for our viewers who don't know you, you know, they don't know your history in the gaming, in the hospitality industry. Right. You've got, your family has several restaurants, yep. uh, bars. You you used to own uh, Rocky Mountain Gaming, right? Yep. And Sea Loman Games. And Sea Loman Games. Yep. Yeah. And, and what those are, those are what we call a route operator who owns the machines like you see yep. behind us. And you basically lease them to the bar. Yep. All of them. And, establishments around the state. Yep. Yeah, you you have a very high level of customer service. How? Where did that come from? I think just I think it's just because I wanted to do the best I could. I really did. I wanted to be the best service provider you could because I figured that was the least chance of getting not being able to renew contracts. When I did my contracts, I figured if I did the best possible service, they would never be able to get rid of me. And I just kept that in the back of my mind the whole time I was doing that. And everybody else was switching to no service. And I kept my nose to the grindstone and did the service all the way through to the end. Because all the people around me were trying to say, you don't need to do all that. You're working too hard. You're doing this. You don't need to count their money. You don't need to service them. You need to train them how to service it. And I said, no, I'm a customer service business. Mm -hmm. And I want to continue it that way all the way through. So I was kind of one of the last person to keep doing it the old, kind of the old fashioned way, but just go there, service the machine, change the lights, do the paper, do everything the correct way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just try to skip that step and think they can get away with it. It does get away with it for a while, but eventually it comes back to start haunting you. And I'm seeing that in some of these businesses. You know, Fleetwood really went through some tough times because they weren't servicing people, so everybody'd steal all their customers. Mm -hmm. And now Gold is in battle with Century stealing the customers because of customer service. And mm -hmm. So it's, it's all it's still all relevant. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd be a super good customer service, positive, and bring value to the customer, and that's how I would continue. I, I mean, I lost probably five customers in 30 years of business, and I gained probably 50. And I never advertised, I never marketed, I never did anything. It was all word of mouth. All my businesses have been word of mouth, which is not necessarily the correct thing, but that's what how it happened. Well, it's, you know, the, the statistics are what statistics are. The, you know, we can all make up numbers, but the numbers I've seen are that 80 per, over 80% 80 of people will buy from you if they're a referral, right? So you, and, and it doesn't, a referral doesn't cost you anything. Right. Right, that's the great thing about word of mouth that I love. That's what I have always pushed. Number one in my business is referrals. Find the people that you can help, right, and then they will refer business right. to you. Yep. Right? How can I make somebody else's business better? And if you do things the right way for long periods of time, you have lots of referrals. And when you start doing things not the right way, or you're taking shortcuts, or you're doing illegal things, or you're doing stuff that's not right then you start going sideways on that thought process. And a lot of people do that. They get sideways because they get lazy, they don't want to do stuff, they get shortcut and everything. And that's where you, that's where that fails. You let somebody down on a referral, yeah. you're not getting any more referrals. Mm -hmm. So that's, you gotta be consistent, persistent forever if you're, if you're gonna keep that mode going. I like that, be consistent, persistent forever. forever. <laughs> I can't even write it down fast enough. <laughs> so, where where did this develop from? Like, is this something your dad taught you as a young 
kid or was it something you saw in other business people and, and you emulated that or did you just come up with it yourself? I think I just came up when I got really aggressive when I was in high school. I uh, told myself, God, my mom and dad don't have any money. We're eating deer meat. We're eating just junk food, you know, just horrible foods. I just hated the food we were eating and the shelter wasn't that good. And we had no cars to speak of, riding bikes. I thought, so I started working. I collected beer cans at three in the morning till five. I delivered papers from five to seven. Then I went to school. And a lot of times I'd work after school. I mm -hmm. just tried to work and work and try to make money to help them. Plus, I needed money for college. They weren't going to pay for college. They had no college fund. Mm -hmm. So I could write, you know, see that I wasn't going to have it. So when I was a junior in high school, I ran a large construction. I was the manager of a construction company and I was the manager of a way campground. I did two jobs and I managed the construction and that. So I got into business early on and said, yes, I can do this. The people are going, are you sure? Oh, yeah. And I had no knowledge. I mean, I had just saying that without the actual knowledge, but I knew if I worked at it hard enough, I could figure it out. And that's something I started believing in myself. If you if you believe yourself can do something, you can do a lot of things, amazing things if you really believe in it. And so I started believing in myself and did the construction. I mean, we put up 2,000 grain bins in two summers, a big elevators. Uh, I was managing 20 guys. You know, and I was the youngest one there, 17, and everybody else is 20s, 30s. Mm -hmm. I'm the manager of the whole construction company. I had no management experience. And then when I got out of college, I went down to California, no computer experience. Started working at a computer company, repairing computers that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to go there and act like I knew what I was doing. So <laughs> I didn't even know how to plug them in or turn them on. But by the time I left during the day, I'd have them fixed. Mm -hmm. Get on the phone, do what it any resource you could come up with to fix it. Mm -hmm. And then, you, then our company wanted me to bill for all that time and I refused to bill. When I first went there, they were gonna fire me. They wanted me to bill for eight hours of me training myself. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm not, I'm billing for two hours, that's it. I should have known all the rest. So I kind of got into it with the, the bosses before long. I knew more than everybody in the whole office within six months because I was just digging in so much deeper and going to training and getting the special badges. I had all the, I, I watched the space shuttle land. I didn't even know what the space shuttle was. I was out at Edwards Air Force working on a computer and I was 20 yards from the runway and this thing's coming. I'm going, what is this thing? <laughs> I had no idea what the space shuttle was, never heard of it. And I saw it landing and it landed. I was standing by the runway. The guys started yelling. I ran out there and stood by the runway. I was 10 feet from the runway when it landed. <laughs> came back a came back the next day to finish working on the computer and they were loading it on a big 757 or whatever. Yeah. And I watched that and then the next day I came and they were flying it out of there. <laughs> and, I, and that's the first I heard of the space shuttle or knew anything about it. Cause I, when you're super busy and trying to do all this, you don't sit and watch news. I never yeah. watch, I don't watch TV. I never watched TV for the first 20 years of my life because I, it's just a waste of time. And I didn't spend any time doing that. I'd spend it with the kids playing, never turn the TV on, just because I didn't have enough time to do TV, kids, and work. Mm -hmm. So that's what went away. Yeah. And a lot of my fun stuff went away. I didn't go fishing a lot. I didn't play softball and get drunk on the weekends with my friends. Mm -hmm. And I passed on all that. Yeah. I still played softball, but I'd go play the game and leave, and they'd all stand around for four hours and, you know, go downtown mm -hmm. later. So I just passed on all that and went to the kids and stuff. And mm -hmm. So I tried to make good priority you know early on. clearly plus i always thought if you make money when you're younger it's a lot easier than making money when you're older mm -hmm. well and you have full you're full of energy you have nothing but energy when you're young and, yeah and i looked at older people and they're not the same as when i was looking at them going these guys don't have the energy yeah you know why wouldn't you take advantage of all that wow and and of course you standing next to the space shuttle was pre-selfie days yeah. Oh yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't even. We didn't even have phones. Yeah. I just stopped at pay phones to tell somebody I saw it. I called the boss on the way home. Said I stopped at pay phone. Said hey, saw something pretty cool today. The space shuttle landed right by me. He goes, really? He goes, yeah. I thought it Edwards fixing their because they were thinking about unmanned airplanes at that mm -hmm. moment. I was actually fixing a computer for unmanned aircraft. And I was they had some bad memory chips in it. And I was going through the testing and I figured out what that was. Mm -hmm. But I had absolutely no knowledge. I've never been to Edwards Air Force Base. I'd never had any of this experience. But I went and got the security badge and I spent a whole month getting the highest security in the whole company. So I could go anywhere without even questioning that. I'd show my badge and I'd just go anywhere. Anywhere. 
I could have walked in the White House with that thing. And you you took that all on yourself. On myself, it wasn't yeah. required. None of that. But I wanted to go to Ed, I wanted to go to Edwards. I wanted to go to uh, Hollywood. You needed mm -hmm. a special one for there. I mean, I watched all the video movies getting shot. I don't know anything about movies, but I went. And I was really interested in all the equipment, all the filming. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to uh, McDonnell Douglas where they built all built all the airplanes for the yeah. military. I went all over to other places. In two year time frame, I went everywhere every day. And everybody else sat in the office. There was eight of us doing the same job. I was the only one gone every day. Wow. So, Clint. And they hated me because I was working too hard. And I was going oh. to be the next boss. And when I figured it out, I said, I'm leaving. I can't stand it. I have these guys working for me. That's, how, that's why I left. Because they said, We're thinking about moving you up to be the boss of these guys. And I'm going, I looked around and I go, These guys hate me. I work too hard. Yeah. They hate me. So I said, I, I gotta, I gotta move back to Montana. I can't live in here. I can't yeah. live in California. These people don't like to work. You, well, you, and you, it just spooked me. You know, you, you literally beat me to my next question, which was, what got you back to Montana then? That pretty much did. And then I got up a couple mornings and I had spray paint on the side of my car, and I'd go out there and scrub that shit off. And it just pissed <laughs> me off, you know. Yeah. And I thought, I'm not gonna live here. I mean, these guys are painting my car tonight. They go down the street and paint everybody's stripe down, you know, with spray paint cans. Oh. So then I had no way to park in a driveway. They didn't have garages. Mm -hmm. So every, you know, I had to worry about my car every night getting painted. And then I thought, geez, how am I going to raise my kids around this stuff? It's mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, just not my style. So my dad called me one day when I was starting to think about all this. And he said, hey, I'm, leaving. I'm moving to Butte. Mm -hmm. I got about... 10 pinball machines and a couple of jukeboxes that I've been working on at night. You want to come back and buy them and try to do something in Glendive? And I go, not really, but I guess I'll try it. I don't really know what I'm going to do in Glendive. Mm -hmm. And so packed it up, moved to Glendive. Wow. That's, uh, that's gutsy. I just knew I couldn't live there very long. Why? I was going to be the boss in like a week. And I yeah. was getting pretty nervous. Why Glendive? <laughs> That's just where I was from, and that's where my mom and dad lived, and I had no money to speak of. I saved all my money in California. I didn't mm -hmm. spend any of it because I lived with some people so I wouldn't have to pay rent. Mm -hmm. Some friends from North Dakota because I wanted to save all my money. I knew I wasn't going to stay there. Then I moved back to Glendive with no knowledge of anything. Just thought I got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people around there. So you used that money to then catapult yep. into your first venture. Yep, I bought a little pizza place in a building, and I thought, well, I'm going to try to take and bake pizzas. No one's ever tried that before. And I tried it, and the more I got into the restaurant business, the more I realized I hate restaurants. You got to clean them at 11 o'clock at night, and <laughs> people don't want to show up, and it's hard to make money. People complain about the pizza, not enough toppings, too much cheese, not enough sauce. I thought, I don't need this every day. So I sold the restaurant, but kept the building. Mm -hmm. Then they started making you know rental payments. I thought, God, this is how you own real estate. That's how I figured out real estate. I go, mm -hmm. they're paying for my payment on the building. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. So then I went along for about a year or two, and then they decided to close. Now I have an empty building. Now Edward D. Jones comes to me and says, hey, I'd like to buy your building. It's in a great location. So then I tripled my money on the building after somebody paid for it for two years. I thought, mm -hmm. oh, I get that. That's equity. And so I took my money, went to buildings, bought three buildings, put down payments on buildings, borrowed the rest, rented them up, fixed them up. That's kind of how I got into real estate. Started realizing how that worked. Okay. The, the, the good old rich dad, poor dad. So I went to buildings, yeah, and started renting buildings, and then uh, they would buy them, and then I'd do something else. Then I went and bought a piece of ground in West Billings, owned it for six months, bought it for you know four or five hundred grand, sell it for a million and a half. I go, wow, this is cool. This is how this works, you know. Mm -hmm. As expansion, and I never really got deep into the development, but I and I built the golf course in Billings, and then you know I started buying stuff. I bought a casino in Billings because a friend of mine wanted to get out. He didn't know how to make money, and I bought it from Tommy Haugen's dad. And, he was just going to walk away from Brandy's, and I bought it. And it didn't work. I couldn't figure out why it didn't work, so I put a wall, cut it in half, and it worked like a charm. Just leave the other part empty. It was too big. I started looking in there. No one's comfortable in here. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I put a wall up, cut it in half, and it just started booming. And it's boomed ever since. Wow. So the other half, eventually I put a poker room in there, but it was empty for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Nothing in there. I bought a 5,000 square foot building, and cut it in half, and never put anything in there. Just left. <laughs> so just stuff like that I guess and then I just started parlaying real estate and, and buildings I you know one time I owned about 60 buildings around around the state here yeah I sold quite a few of them but 
I still have quite a few pieces of real estate and then I just started doing businesses. I got in the golf course business, truck stop business, mm -hmm. casino business, restaurant business, software business, oil business. I mean, we recently in the Bakken, we invented a new IP for hauling and delivering frack sand and we pretty much revolutionized the whole fracking business and we have no, five of us were involved in this and none of us had any oil field experience. But we went and looked at what they were doing and said, these guys don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're not using gravity. You ever heard of gravity guys, you know? <laughs> they were blowing all the sand instead of using gravity. So yeah. we built a total gravity system and it just revolutionized the whole fracking business. Wow. We're, we're in about 30% of all the fracking in the whole United States right now. And we're in Argentina and in the last two years, mm -hmm. just from this idea that we built in the garage and plexiglass. Yeah. And took it to market. So it's been pretty interesting. That's been a really good, really good learning to take a really small idea and, and it's blown up into a monster business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably worth two, three hundred million dollars in you know five year time frame. It's just amazing. To me, it's even amazing. I have a small piece of it, but it's still amazing mm -hmm. how it all came to fruition. And you know, a lot of the decisions were based on what my thoughts were is why we got where we are because mm -hmm. the other four guys couldn't make decisions mm -hmm. they just locked up and i would say no we're not doing that and i just put my foot down until we got going down the right path and it was quite a path because we picked partners that we didn't know very well and we were none of us were in the business we didn't even know what emp was we didn't know what frack crews were we didn't know what none of that we didn't midstream upstream we didn't know any of the terminology mm -hmm. and we were trying to sell something that we had no idea mm -hmm. so it's quite a quite a deal but it it's something that it, because basically our system is 30 percent cheaper no noise no dust yeah and before fracking had a 200 foot plume oh. of dust over and it was so loud you couldn't even think yeah and it shook so bad you couldn't stand on it i mean you stand around it you, you just drive you nuts i went on a frack for two weeks and i said i, I could never work here i was starting <laughs> to get kind of like i was feeling like my nervous system was kind of acting up yeah just from the shaking sit there and sh shake you to death from oh, all wow. the blowing of sand yeah and so ours is you run a frack now and you can't even tell it's running people walk up to us and say when are you going to start we're right in the middle of it because mm -hmm. it's so quiet no dust and so wow. it's, it's pretty amazing wow that's neat so that's kind of going small the big you know yeah it's a place to getting slowly revolutionizing into bigger business and and revolutionizing a business that you had no concept of never even thought about doing a business before yeah just went out there to do my lagoons remember mm -hmm. and i was sitting around in the bars and over at my friend's apartment going you know why don't you take me out to a frack job i'd like to see how it works so we went out and looked at one and we're seeing all this dust and we're going wow and the other guy we used to work in the uh, sand and gravel business here in bozeman he goes yeah you shouldn't be blowing dust you can't blow sand it creates all this dust you mm -hmm. got you know you got to use gravity so then we went back and we built these plexiglass little boxes to try to figure out how, how it would work. And then we went and bought some frac sand and tested it and said, mm -hmm. oh, okay, this works. Mm -hmm. And we built a big conveyor system and got involved with some engineers out of Wisconsin and Minnesota. And before long, we built a prototype. Mm -hmm. Took it to people in the block and they looked at it and said, no, 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 no. We've done it 40 years of fracking the old way. This ain't going to do it. So we thought, oh, oh, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. Then the oil price started dropping and then all these people started calling us saying, God, we got to have your system. Hurry up. We want to be partners. Yeah. So then we started weighing all that and we ended up hooking up with somebody from Wisconsin and somebody from Denver and fired up a business and it's been unbelievable. Wow. What a, what a great story. Yeah. I mean, what, what, fun. what a journey you've been through, right? Yeah. And, and still a long ways to go. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm just learning these uh, private equity things, which have been a lot of fun. Yeah. How they check out each different project and weigh them out and they, you know, I just never went into that kind of detail like they do. I mean, the due diligence is amazing that they do. I mean, I look at that stuff and say, oh my God. Yeah. I got so lucky to be successful without doing that. I never mm -hmm. did any of the due diligence. Yeah. I skipped the due diligence process. I went with my gut feeling and it worked. Yeah. Where these guys just, they analyze it down to the pennies. I mean, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing, but they don't have the gut feeling even <coughs> knowledge to even make the right decision even after they analyze it yeah so that's why they really like my perspective versus their perspective yeah ha huh, that's that's crazy i, I love it you, you know I, I i warned you we were going to be at this for a while and it's probably blowing your mind that you've been able to talk for an hour yeah. <laughs> for for those of you who don't know clint this makes him horribly uncomfortable but he's done an awesome job clint 
I thank can't you. thank you enough for sitting down with us. This this was it's fantastic. Fun, yeah. um, folks, this has probably been my favorite interview to date. Uh, no offense to any of the other people we've interviewed, but Clint has had such a diverse background that this was amazing. The journey, I've scribbled notes as fast as I could at times just to try and capture little snippets. I know I'll be going back and rewatching this one, Clint. Um, everybody, thank you for, for watching this. Uh, you know, you can catch us on our podcast. You can catch us on YouTube. You can catch it at mttaxlaw.com. Uh, we're, you know, spread the word because we're getting uh, amazing people here that are donating their time to educate other business owners just like Clint did today. You know, know your peas, have your passion, have your persistence, have your hard work. Um, get after it, folks. Be decision makers. Don't let the decision making stall you out. You know, don't get caught in a sideways loop. You, you want to, you, you got to be pushing forward. Got to take those risks at times, but measure your risks, right, yep. Clint? Um, I, I can't thank you enough. Yep, uh, thank you. Like us, share us, folks. Uh, boy, I, I'm just in awe of what I just got to uh, experience. It was just fantastic, the knowledge, the stuff I'm going to get to run with personally. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yep. Uh, you know, the Montana Business Vlog, where we're just trying to help small businesses. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Brad. <laughs>